start with the hi hat. Just start hitting the. Hi -hat. Right after World War II. Japan's a parking lot. It's been bombed into virtually flat nothingness in most of the great big cities, and particularly Tokyo. Immediately after which, a quarter million GIs and American and Allied service guys and dependents and all of the support systems and everybody literally move right into town. So there's a major collision of cultures here. And this is where a lot of the language started to change. Even the word television, terabi, comes from, you know, trying to say the word television. If you're saying salad, the word salad in Japanese is sarada, S-A-R-A-D-A, -A -A, it's somebody trying to say salad, but if you don't have the word L or the letter L in your alphabet, then, you know, things are a little bit tough. So you start to, your patrol car, patoka, is, that's literally out of the dictionary. So, you know, this is where that comes from, that collision of culture. And if you see pictures of Tokyo, it's, uh, it was virtually flat. I call it a parking lot. Most of it was destroyed by, uh, you know, uh, the aerial carpet bombing, etc. That's what brought about the end of the war, ultimately, and started the new version of Japan which virtually was an outdoor market. If you see photos of it, you talk to people who were survivors from that time period, and that's all grandparents kind of age. My Uncle Manny remembers all of this vividly. Is you had something like 50, 60,000 outdoor stalls and carts and uh, you know upended boxes with people cooking chicken on a skewer and selling whatever you know you could possibly scrounge together and sell think outdoor shopping mall 1940s early 1950s style everybody has to kind of live together outdoors it's a big outdoor kind of like uh, like homeless village uh, enter organized crime Okay, we're the only kinds of people who can control the population, particularly after dark when electricity is kind of sketchy, and who has the money for bulbs and wires, et cetera, et cetera. People are getting drunk on homemade sake and homemade gin at night, regardless, because the weather is horrifying there. Land of the gods is also the land of tears, man. It's uh, in the middle of the summer, it's complete jungle and this unbelievably humid, stinking hot. In, uh, in the middle of the winter, it, it, it snows. So you have everybody very virtually living outdoors together. You have a lot of people who are unfamiliar with living outdoors. Hey, when was the last time you spent a few weeks living outdoors? And I don't mean you went to the bathroom indoors. I don't mean that you had a shower that you could use. <laughs> Me neither. It's been a while. Living outdoors is an acquired art form, and there's no such thing as shitty weather, just shitty gear. Well, back in the 40s and 50s, there was nothing but shitty gear. Everything is made out of cotton and just wool, and it's none, none this and none that, and none, all of it's flammable, and that's what was happening in Japan at this time period. And uh, you know, the folks who are living there are uh, feeling the pressures of life and daily life, etc., pretty readily as uh, they continue on. Every grain is precious and must be salvaged. All through the nation, every available plot is turned into garden, even amidst the wreckage. In the middle of this scene, having now set this scene, you get 1952, I think it is, and my dates are, you know, on and off variously, uh, was the first, uh, one of the very first 
broadcasts on television, was on general television, I think was the only company who made televisions then, had what was called the Mitsubishi Fight Man Awa. And uh, A-W-A mean hour, H-O-U-R, okay, and fight man, well, you know, it's like walk man, you know, who would think of that? Nobody in America would think of that word, walk man, but it makes perfect sense. So you know what a fight man is. And just like in the United States, I think one of the first broadcasts on regular television in the United States was wrestling. To this moment, as I speak and breathe in front of you, wrestling is the most popular thing on American television. At any given time, there's five different channels of The, the Undertaker versus Stone Cold against uh, The Grim Reaper versus The Thug Bros. <laughs> or whoever in a battle royale, thug fest, uh, cage match, death fest. I'm, if nothing else, I'm getting the t-shirt. I may not actually attend the event, but well, I'm going to get on the internet right after this and purchase some merchandise. <laughs> You just gotta. What I'm getting at is it's not an entirely new convention. And in 1952, I forget, uh, you know, it may, it may not be exactly that year, on the Mitsubishi Fight Man Awa, in uh, one of the stadiums, it holds about 20,000 people in the eastern part of Tokyo, the Sharp Brothers, a couple of fellows, big guys, like six foot six, come out of the Midwest in the United States. This is after the war are touring around Asia, think more like carnival, more like circus than uh, actual sporting event, and they're doing professional wrestling as we came to know the old school. You know, with the, the big speedo type trunks and the big black boots, more like boxing boots, and you know, the Andre the Giant kind of an approach. And uh, they versing, versus, a, uh, a fellow named Ricky Dozen, and I believe he had a uh, partner. This was a tag team match. I don't recollect his partner's name. They are incalculably outweighed. Ricky Dozen is a one-name fellow. He'd come from sumo, but he was not big enough to compete legitimately or you know, successfully in sumo. He was only about 220, 245 pounds. That's nowhere near big enough to compete in sumo and actually win, but big enough to do professional wrestling, which was brand new to Japan and was brought there by the American service guys. They were gonna be a lot of in, in attendance, you know, buying the ticket to actually go to the event. And this is, you know, who had televisions? Well, everybody on board ship, everybody on base had televisions in the rec rooms and the OCs, the officer clubs, and you know, some of the barracks, etc. had televisions. Very few Japanese had televisions at all. They didn't even know what it was much less what professional wrestling was. Ricky Dozen steps into the middle of the match, and there are maybe three different rounds, and for the t first two rounds, he gets his ass handed to him. The Sharp brothers are six foot six, Benny Sharp or whatever, six foot six, these guys are huge. And they're throwing him around, and every possible insurrectionary, you know, f every bad, false, every uh, foul that you could possibly enact, every time the referee turns his back, there's something that's some terrifying, awful, vicious poke or move or some subtraction of the rules. The referee never gets to see it. He has no idea what's going on. And, uh, you know, the audience is beside themselves, you know, in this arena. They can't believe what's going on. They can't believe that the referee, the referee must be on the take, etc. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the despair is like a fog, as it was written about, as it is described by those who were actually there. It was like a fog, the despondent, depressing despair of loss again, which already haunted over Tokyo like a sick blackening cloud, Bible black and starless, sank even lower upon a, pay, a, a group of people who's upon shoulders was already life was like a yoke. And then the third round happened. <laughs> Look 
And Ricky Dozen came running out of the corner with his two famous moves. And he was not a great wrestler at all. Ricky was had two moves. First was sumo pushing, which is just pushing and going like this. And then the second was the James Bond karate chop. And it's not actually called the James Bond karate chop. I happen to know it because I learned it from watching James Bond movies in the early 60s, is you chop somebody in the back of the head and they pass out instantly if you do it right. We practiced it on each other on schoolyards for many, many years. And occasionally it would work. And this was Ricky Dozen's two big moves. And he came racing out of the corner and uh, taking on both of the Sharp brothers and began to take it to him. And the entire stadium went beyond ecstatic, beyond, it was incontainable, their ecstasy. And they began to tear up the chairs and behave in a most decidedly un-Japanese fashion. And nobody would ever seen anything reaction like that in an audience at a sporting event like this. They totally believed that Ricky Dozen was for real. Nobody had any idea that this whole team had been instructed backstage by the American and Japanese promoters to approach this as a theatrical event. It was a show and that it was not to be approached like by a, uh, as an athletic event. The real show was outside the doors of that arena. station, for example, it's a train station that I use all the time. I'm always using the underground trains and stuff in Tokyo now. And uh, there's probably a hundred and some train stations. And at each station, at the Shibuya station, which is right across from Shibuya Crossing, the most busy intersection on Earth. You, Shelley, put up some Shibuya Crossing footage. You can find this very easily. At Shibuya Station, there are almost 100 exits. So people get lost in this place. It's, it's like a Tom Hanks movie or something. You could easily get lost in Shibuya Station. <laughs> and keep entering, you could actually live there. You know, there's shopping malls and, you know, the whole thing connected. We call it Underground City, UG City. And uh, I'm sure there's a, a businessman's hotel or something immediately adjacent. You would never have to surface. And um, so there are many, many train stations that have been there since before the war been there since the turn of the century, since the 1800s, Japanese railway system was very developed very, very early on. And um, at Ueno Station alone were 20,000 people. Let's kind of get in our mind's eye how many people that actually is. 20,000 people is Madison Square Garden sold out in the round. Not like a Van Halen show where we cut the end off because we have a great big stage, but like a Springsteen show where there's people all the way around. Do you follow? 20,000 people is like Staples Center in Los Angeles. 20,000 people is like the big basketball arena full, wherever it is you live. And uh, that's just one railway station. 20,000 people watching one television set, a 27-inch general TV sitting on the back of an army truck plugged into a generator. Can you imagine sitting in the back of a completely full 20,000 person sold out Madison Square Garden hockey arena watching a small sized television set in black and white with 20,000 other people just even trying to focus on what's going on there. And everything would have to be rifled back. 
all of the info of what just happened and what foul was just enacted was all rifled back and passed back like that party game where you whisper to each other and the rumor grows and the insurrection and the horribleness increases <laughs> until finally the ambulances were literally, this is all well documented, were working overtime, picking the bodies of those who had fainted, passed out, there were heart attacks, people who were already Ready, borderline chronic some condition or another slipped over the border because of their paroxysms of rage and despair. I'm only using these adjectives because these are the adjectives that after Ricky Dozen disposed of the Sharp brothers and became victorious and everybody went crazy the very next day. The New York Times, the LA Times, the Chicago Times, the Dallas Times, and the Miami Times, all of those equivalents in Japan put it on the front page headlines. Ricky Dozen retrieves the dignity of Japan. Ricky Dozen saves the souls of the future of the children of Japan and shows that Japan can transcend and transpire and can once again rise to the greatest heights of heights. <laughs> Nobody really questioned for the longest period of time that uh, Ricky was doing not only theater, but Ricky wasn't even Japanese. How very Japanese. Ricky Dawson came from uh, Korea. <laughs> And he took on one name, like the way the sumo tori, the rikishi, the wrestlers in uh, sumo do. They take on individual names. Uh, sometimes they mean things like uh, Raging Storm or Great Mountain. You get names like uh, Mitoz Mitozushi or uh, Konishiki or uh, Chonofuji. Sometimes they just sound good, but it's, you know, the way we do it in the United States is probably based on the way it's been done in sumo and in their version of professional wrestling long before we got started. Da Vinci, of all people, claimed that all great fine arts started with Japan or was exported from Japan or got stolen from Japan long before any of us white boys, quote unquote Europeans or anybody, discovered what was actually going on here. So. If you consider professional wrestling and all of its variations a fine art form, and we do, then yeah, we got the idea from the Japanese. Take a single name and just call yourself the, uh, the Undertaker instead of Kevin. <laughs> call yourself Stone Cold The Rock instead of Kenny. <laughs> I'm down, I get this, whether it's in Japan, Nihongo or not, I'm with it, let's go. And uh, so this is, again, this is, this is an idea that is a thousand years old, it's a thousand years old. And uh, Ricky Dozen had come from Korea, attempted to become sumatori, you know, the, trained in sumo, and uh, was not big enough. He was okay, so-so, but you have to be huge. Um, now, I'm leading up to uh, sort of uh, something here and all of this story about, you know, what wrestling means to the United States, what wrestling means to Japan. I'm going to try to explain, kind of we're going to go back to the root of this instead of the fruit of it, because it all comes from sumo. And 
uh, my pal in Tokyo here, Konoshiki, is one of the most famous uh, sumo wrestlers of all times. He was a great, great champion for many, many years. He still is involved, uh, still trains, still uh, competes, etc. cetera. Um, just to give you an idea, we, we, we're going to put some pictures up here. And uh, I've been invited to go to the Basho, which is the tournament in January, middle of January. As his guest, we're going to go behind the scenes there. Um, and uh, I won't tell you his real name behind the scenes. I don't know if I'm supposed to. But Konoshiki, for example, is not from Japan. Everybody knows that. He's from Hawaii. Uh, Takanahara and Takanawada were two brothers who I think uh, came from Samoa. So there have been, you know, kind of an influx of folks who are, you know, super giant and, you know, are big enough to compete in sumo. Uh, Ricky Dozen, which... Again, it's just fun to say. What a great name. Ricky Dozen. Somebody should start a pants company. Ricky Dozen. A silhouette of you know, Ricky. But Ricky went on to wrestle for many, many years. And uh, behind the scenes, like most of my favorite heroes, he was a hard-drinking, whoremongering. Uh, he was hooked up with organized crime. He was part of the Yakuza. Uh, somebody finally killed him in a gang fight. He was knifed to death in the men's room of a uh, nightclub called the Latin Quarter or the New Latin Quarter downtown in Tokyo. Yes! My kind of downtown guy. Ricky Dozen, the ballad of. How come Bob Dylan never wrote this song? <laughs> they had a Ricky Dozen. Not all is hard work at the Mojo Dojo. We're upstairs in the hallway that leads directly to my bedroom. And you can see in the background as we're passing by that these are all the gold and platinum records that I've earned over the years. Don't break into the house and try and steal them. They're worth nothing except sentimental value. In fact, I think they're just plastic Frank Sinatra records or something that have the little plaque on it, whatever. But the joke was for a long time that if I got the pretty girl to walk all the way the entire length of the hallway and she saw these records, it would cut my foreplay time neatly in half. By the time I got to Phoenix, she was usually Whoa!